spiritual path of Advaita Vedanta uh, is uh, for uh, those who are already prepared from uh, previous dream lifetimes. It is not easy uh, for uh, a lot of people. It is not for the masses. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have the ability to prepare those who are not prepared. So there are scriptures who are offering this kind of preparation, just like uh, Tatva Bodha and other scriptures, also Bhagavad Gita, uh, which are uh, very, very well, uh, uh, very well uh, can prepare those who are not prepared. But in general, Advaita Vedanta is for very, very advanced uh, uh, spiritual seekers. Uh, this we must uh, admit. Uh, but on the other hand, those who are uh, participating in such a Zoom class, uh, also it is not by accident. So most of you, they know about the law of karma. So nothing is by accident. And also Sanatana Dharma speaks always about this law um, and also uh, about uh, that nothing is by accident and also that everybody should uh, uh, follow uh, from, from the standpoint that he or she is in this moment. So we would like from uh, these uh, Zoom classes to, um, to guide those who are prepared enough, but also to guide those who are not prepared enough. Uh, and that's why we started uh, with uh, this introduction. In order to see, uh, some of you are ready to participate in, in, in more advanced classes, and some others are uh, able to participate uh, in the introduction and go step by step. So everybody is most welcome in any case. There are no any... Um, uh, no any other rules about following these classes. Okay, yeah, thanks. I will continue. Well. Anybody who feels that this is too much introduction uh, is uh, most welcome to communicate with Andrew uh, because Andrew is creating a list now with those who are interested for more advanced uh, scriptures. So they can uh, directly communicate with Andrew and ask uh, to be in this list. Uh, but also the, in this introduction, uh, also advanced questions uh, are welcome. Uh, if we will see that uh, this advanced question uh, is not appropriate to work or to deal with in this introductory class, then we can say, uh, just write it uh, on your notebook and we will deal with that a little bit later. And the Shastras say, if the intellect is not used, then human being is as good or as bad as animals only. And therefore, buddhi or intellect or reasoning power is unique. And because of this extra faculty, only we are only we are extremely self-conscious also, capable of self-judgment, capable of comparing myself with other human beings, which the animals do not have. When there is a dog show and they have a competition to find out which dog is well-trained, Dogs are asked to do various things, and then they are given gold, silver, bronze, whatever it is, and there may be three stands, also as in the Olympics. And when they are standing on the stands, what is the feeling of the dog? I have not got gold, or I missed gold by one hundredth of a second? No, the dogs do not have superiority complex. Dogs do not have inferiority complex. They only put their tongues out and look here and there. They don't know, in fact, what the hell or heaven is happening. What the heaven is happening? On the other hand, you know who has the complex. The fellow who owns the dog has a complex. Uh, I'll keep going until somebody has a, a question. I do have a question, actually. 
how do we how do we know that the animals, for example, are not aware they don't do this kind of thought? Nobody ever looked into their head. It's a bold statement to me because there's no proof. At least, you know. Yes. How... Uh, look, in this uh, in in Sanatana Dharma in general, there are a lot of things that we take them as a revelation and everybody is free to accept it or not. So nobody is, uh, nobody is uh, how to say, obliged to accept this, uh, this information, this revelation from the scriptures. But in this uh, uh, path, we consider the scriptures uh, as a real revelation for the truth. And then we start, those who want, of course, we start with a kind of, uh, let's say, trust or faith. And then we try to work on it and see if that is, it can be our own truth or not. But there is no any kind of uh, proof uh, of a lot of things. Uh, we say, for example, in Advaita Vedanta, that there are no egos. There are no persons, there are no individual entities in reality, and that everything is an appearance in consciousness. Somebody can start by taking this uh, revelation uh, in a neutral basis, and then gradually can work with his guru uh, and with the scriptures and with spiritual practices, with sadhana, meditation, and so on and so forth, and see gradually if this can be his or her own truth or not. But a lot of things, yes, they will appear uh, as difficult to be accepted in the first place. But there is no problem because nobody uh, is obliged by the scriptures. The scriptures are just promising that if somebody will keep studying under the guidance of a competent guru, being a part of an authentic and uh, legitimate ancient uh, lineage, that sooner or later, whatever is mentioned in the scriptures will be his or her own truth. But it needs, of course, long study, needs uh, a lot of contemplation and a lot of guidance. So in our scriptures, it is also mentioned that to follow this path and also to uh, search for the truth, for self-realization, it is indispensable to have a guru, to follow a spiritual, a, an authentic spiritual path, and to have uh, scriptural study under the competent guru. All these are uh, prerequisites and indispensable. Again, this somebody is able and is free to accept or not. But in our tradition, in Advaita Vedanta, we follow uh, these uh, prescriptions. We show a kind of trust, a kind of faith. And gradually we try to see uh, if we can accept these revelations or not. But, sorry, I'll, just to follow up question now, because... Sure, sure. If we use it as a foundation to develop the, the thinking, how, you know, I would like to trust. That's the whole point of why I'm here, right? But yes. what was also what attracted me to this Vedanta uh, is the idea that it's spirituality comes out of a uh, kind of philosophy also, right? So for me, it completely makes sense some concepts that are laid down, like the Brahma, whatever. The other things I've experienced directly, it makes complete sense. So I want to trust, but if we here we lay down the foundation in this text, which is the beginning, uh, this, how can we put any building if the foundation is not solid already? So for it, you know what I mean? Because if it's self, we could also, you know, becoming the truth for someone is slightly different than being true by itself. Because people can believe whatever they want. So... Yeah. I would like, I, well, the idea for me is to look, to figure out the truth. So if something is true, it has to become evident, self-evident, like. So 
what's the balance? Because otherwise it's not different than uh, like, for example, Western religions where you kind of have to believe whatever it's tells. I don't want that. Of course you say you're not obliged to. Yeah, of course. But there has to be some reasoning around it for it to make sense, right? Or experience, that's also fine. Yes. Yes, you are, I can. Yeah. you are absolutely right, but it takes some time to have this ability to prove or to confirm some things if they are true or not. So there is no other way by having a kind of uh, strata, it is mentioned in the scriptures, a kind of faith or trust, because there is no other way. I mean, it's very, okay. very difficult to prove to you a lot of things from the very beginning. So the, the very fact that somebody is uh, knocking the door of this path and uh, asking to be uh, a part of a class or a part of teaching shows that there is a kind of uh, karmic link, a karmic connection with this uh, spiritual path. Otherwise, uh, this particular person will, will go somewhere else, uh, to another path or to no path at all. So, the, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, it needs uh, a long study, it needs a lot of mm -hmm. contemplation, it needs meditation, it needs a lot of scriptural study to accept or not accept a lot of things in this path, but in every path. There is no path that from the first day, uh, somebody can prove to you uh, a lot of things. It, unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, it's like that. So give it a try. Uh, take it everything as neutral. Nobody is asking from anybody to accept without uh, discrimination anything at all. In our path, we, we give a lot of importance in discrimination. It is called Viveka, also like Viveka Chudamani, our next scripture, which means that somebody should and must develop discrimination. Uh, there is no other way to find out the truth. But discrimination cannot come from the first day. It needs uh, practice, it needs study, it needs uh, guidance from a guru, it needs to be part of a spiritual path, an authentic lineage. Uh, anybody wants to ask something or say something? I was just going to add to the Luigi's gen general point that, um, and kind of echo what you said before that it, it does take a time. It does take time. Like I followed the Buddhist path for many, many years. I was a Buddhist monk for eleven years. And a lot of the things in the Buddhist path, for example, same with Advaita, I still don't know the answer to some th to some things. But it's a question of just you dip your toe in the water and then you, you get a little taste. You practice some things and you get some results. You know, you try a few things, you get results and you think, well, that worked. I'll try some more. That worked. I'll try some more. That worked. I'll try some more. It's like with, with Swami Paramathananda. I, I've been reading his teachings, and they make they make a lot of sense. And you can try things, and it, then it works for you in your daily life. And you think, okay, I can't accept all of it right now, but what I've tried is beneficial. What I've tried works, and it's like that. You get a, you get a bit of faith through experience, and then there's certain things. How can you know the, about the law of karma? You can't know for sure if. If I do this action, that result will happen. How can you prove it? Very difficult. Some things are so subtle, so esoteric. They're for later. Yes, we Thanks. need to have uh, patience. And uh, sooner or later, we will have a lot of realizations. Uh, Satsitananda also uh, didn't uh, um, had all this realization from the first day. But as the days are passing, uh, there is more and more realization. There is more and more deep understanding. And that is the point also in Advaita Vedanta. We don't want blind faith. 
we want some kind of trust for the beginning. But actually, Advaita Vedanta is not a path of silence, as other paths uh, use a lot of silence and they want a lot of uh, stillness uh, of the mind. In Advaita Vedanta, it's not like that. We want the intellect because we want to use the intellect. We want to use questions and answers. We want to find the truth. And we want to have self-knowledge. We cannot have self-knowledge only with stillness, only with thoughtlessness. It is impossible. It's like you want to learn uh, the Chinese language by staying in stillness. Is that possible? You have to go to a Chinese teacher and you have to learn the, with the books of Chinese. So the same with self-knowledge. Stillness and thoughtlessness is not enough. It may be useful and it may be one of the methods, but it itself is not enough. That's why we, we use a lot of uh, dialogues in uh, Advaita Vedanta, and we want to use a lot the critical thinking. And nobody is asking, uh, is asked to follow anything with blind faith. Just give it a try, keep it neutral, Receive it and work with that, with every teaching. And sooner or later, it will reveal itself if it is true for you or not. But this is what we want. We want self-knowledge. This is called jnana, jnana yoga. And this self-knowledge can be found only with a spiritual mentor, a guide and a spiritual path, and scriptural study, long-term study, regular study. There is no other way without teaching to find out self-knowledge. Teaching is indispensable. It is called sravanam in Advaita Vedanta. Listening the teaching from a competent guru, who himself was a sisya, a disciple of another guru, and so on and so forth. So sravanam, listening to the teaching, study the teaching under the competent guru, then mananam, which means dealing with your questions and with your doubts with the guru, and then nididhyasana, which means Vedantic meditation, making all this that you have received from the guru and the spiritual lineage and the scriptural study, trying to make it your own truth in the heart of your heart. Internalize the truth that you have received from the guru and the scriptural study under the guidance of him. This is the process. And this process, according to each and every individual, is unique. Somebody hears a phrase like Ahambra Masmi, I am consciousness, awareness, and take it immediately. Why? Because in previous dream lifetimes, he was working a lot with his truths. He was doing a lot of spiritual practice, sadhana. He was with a guru and he was working for many years or many lifetimes. And now he listens, Aham Brahmasmi, I'm consciousness awareness, and he takes it immediately. He can grasp it immediately. And there are some others who need lifetimes to accept even some fundamental topics. Why? Because they didn't have enough preparation from the previous dream lifetimes. So there is not a, a general rule for each and every apparent individual. And of course, I say apparent because there are no individuals but they are appearing. And if somebody believes that he is an individual entity, then he needs a spiritual path. He needs a spiritual guru. He needs a spiritual study, scriptural study. And he needs to find out sooner or later whether he is a, an individual entity or not. But Advaita Vedanta mentions all the time that there are no individual entities. There is no even, even the universe. 
which is called Jagrat. The Jagrat and the apparent individuals and the apparent objects are just an appearance in consciousness. Just like the appearances in the dream in the night. Everything looks real in the night, in the dream. Everything has utility in the dream. If you are thirsty and you receive a glass of water, your thirst will go away. There is experienceability. You are experiencing things. You are doing transactions. There is transactability in the dream. You are interacting with other apparent individuals. And uh, this utility, transactability and experienceability appears also in what we call the waking state. But that doesn't mean that this world and what we are experiencing has an inherent existence. There is only borrowing existence from consciousness. So consciousness is lending apparent existence, apparent reality to all that we see in this world, in this so-called waking world. We have to finish. We've got like one minute. So I just want to say goodbye to everybody rather than just get cut off. Uh, and to say thank you very much, everybody, for coming along to the class. It was it was great. Um, but we'll get, it'll get smoother as we continue. Sure. Find, find our feet. Um, but thank you very, very much and hope to see everybody next same time next week. Yes. Thank you. Welcome and namaste. Namaste. namaste.